Well, good morning, everyone. It is around 10 o'clock, so I hope that you guys are here and on time. We're here together, and I've got uh, Jim and Pastor Holly and myself, and we're here to bring you this morning's devotions. I'm so glad to be here with you today. I'd like to start out by uh, with a word of prayer. Let's dedicate this time to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time where we can praise your name and glorify you, Lord God. And we just want to lift up your voice and be a sweet sound in your ear. And today, Lord, as we um, as we sing and as we read some devotionals that were prepared by others, Lord, I pray that you would bless hearts uh, throughout this campus, Lord, that everyone who sees this or hears this message, Lord, would be, would be blessed by it. And uh, be here with us at this time, Lord, comfort each one in their homes as they as they uh, watch us today. And we just thank you so much for the ability to come and sing and praise you today. In thy name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, as usual, I'll start out with a scripture. And our first scripture comes out of the book of Psalms. And it is, what, chapter 36 and number 7 through 9. Let me read that to you. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and give, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Amen. Precious words from the psalmist. Uh, Jim has uh, some insights on that from him. From, uh, I was... Um thinking of hymns that would work and pair very well with the scripture readings for today. And I grew up in a household that my dad said every single day, Jimmy, every day is Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, so my favorite Thanksgiving hymn is Come, Ye Thankful People Come. And I think it works beautifully with the scripture, Psalm 36. Yes. <laughs> so nice to have 
beautiful singers in our presence here. I'm so glad to have you guys here. We are moving on from Psalm 36 to Psalm 132, and we'll be reading verse 15. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Have insight on that for us here? Um, I'm still uh, somebody who is always in awe of King David and the Psalms and um, singing joyfully, sing hallelujah to the Lord. So I thought uh, one of my favorite hymns is Beautiful City, oh, yeah. which has a, a very wonderful, probably inaccurate history. But the Norwegians claim it was a 12th century crusader hymn. And who's going to argue with the <laughs> right. Norwegians? Uh, um, beautiful Savior uh, has so many good, wonderful lines, um, particularly when we're talking about the brightness of Jesus' light. Jesus shines purer than all the angels in the sky. <laughs> Join us in Beautiful Savior. <laughs> that hymn has several really awesome concepts in it for us to think about even during the Lenten season. Beautiful Savior, King of creation. He is still the God who is on the throne and in charge of all that's going on in our nations today. But you know when it says Son of God and Son of Man, that is really what the religious leaders had the biggest problem with when they were thinking about what was this Jesus and who was this Jesus and what was his message. And the fact that he chose to be son of man was okay, a good teacher, somebody that they could admire teaching in the synagogues. But when he started talking about being the son of God, being God himself, that's what really turned them against him. And so as we think about this Lenten season and his journey to the cross, we celebrate the fact that he is son of God and son of man. And Jesus calls himself son of man, right? I think. He's referring back to Daniel 9 when it talks about the Son of Man. And it's not, they're not talking about a man who was godlike. They're talking about a God who was manlike and became man. Well, our, our next verse goes to uh, John chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 12. 
And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. I have always been very fond of Fanny Crosby hymns for many, many reasons. One is that she's an inspiration, someone who wrote over 8,000 pieces of music and was blind from six weeks old. And Blessed Assurance has a very special um, story. And she was visiting um, an esteemed musician friend of hers who said, I have a melody. And she said, I would like you to think of, of words to put for this. And at that very moment, someone recorded her saying, her writing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Mm -hmm. spots in our own rooms and not really able to be out with each other we think of ourselves as being alone and yet that's what's kind of happening everywhere across churches and all sorts of other places where people no longer can gather but we share this story this is our song that Jesus is our Savior and he's here to give us hope and he continues to give us hope no matter what it is we face every day and I'm so glad that we have friends and neighbors here uh, people caring for us, people preparing our food, um, and a place to be, a place to belong and to share our story, this wonderful story of Jesus. Well, here's some words from Sarah Young for March 23rd. I am a God of both intricate detail and overflowing abundance. When you entrust the details of your life to me, you are surprised by how thoroughly I answer your petitions. I take pleasure in hearing your prayers, so feel free to bring me all your requests. The more you pray, the more answers you can receive. Best of all, your faith is strengthened as you see how precisely I respond to your specific prayers. Because I am infinite in all my ways, you need not fear that I will run out of resources. Abundance is at the very heart of who I am. Come to me in joyful expectation of receiving all you need and sometimes much more. I delight in showering blessings on my beloved children. Come to me with open hands and heart, ready to receive 
all that I have for you. It's interesting, I remember when I was going to first married and going to school and going to seminary, how God provided for me so many times. You know, I was in a place where I didn't have financial resources and so it was easy to see. You know, a check comes in out of nowhere or something uh, closed. I, my my, uh, my brother-in-law made this comment. He's like, he said, it was amazing. Your cars never wore out. Your, your clothes, it was just like in the, in the in scriptures. You know, things didn't wear out. Things just went went well because God was taking care. Take, was taking care of us. It was that bounty. It may, may not have been in, you know, riches and posh things, but it was bounty in that all the things we had lasted. For as long as we need to. Well, the last thing I have is uh, this um, story out of, of uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Did you want to pray before that? Sure. Father, we just come before you today and we are so grateful for your love for us and your care for us. And we are so grateful for all of those who are caring for us here at Johanna Shores. I pray for all of our friends and our, our neighbors here that they will sense your presence with them and as food is served to them as uh, medicine is given to them as encouraging words are shared we pray that you would lift up our spirits be close to us be near to us help us to know that you walk with us and you talk with us and you are present with us even in these circumstances and so today we can share this prayer that people have shared just forever since you taught it to people, Jesus. And today we share that prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, if you remember, I've been reading out of this book by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. And it's a story of his survival of the Holocaust. And some people have asked me, why would you want to read a book that seems so depressing, especially at a time when we need encouragement, right? And and if you remember from the sermon on Sunday, we talked about love. And we said, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, love does not re rejoice in evil, but in good, when good happens. And you see that sometimes in just in the very heart of who we are. When I, I like, my son loves it when I tell him a bedtime story. But when the bad guys are winning, he gets really uncomfortable. And he can't wait. He can't wait until the good guys win, right? He, he, wants, he wants good to triumph. He's waiting for good to triumph, and I think a lot of times we are too. We're waiting for good to triumph, and even in these terrible circumstances where we see uh, man's inhumanity to man, we're waiting for good to triumph in those in those moments. And so, as I read through it, I'm waiting to see where God is going to triumph in this situation. And it may not seem like there there is um, any good at all, but. This, uh, th this man who wrote this is finding good in this situation from time to time. You see it in this book, and uh, it, to me, it, it's, it's encouraging to see that uh, in him. So I'll just continue from where we were. But I'm telling you things out of their turn. From a psychological point of view, we had a long, long way in front of us from the break of that dawn at the station until our first night's rest at the camp. Escorted by SS guards with loaded guns, we were made to run from the station past electrically charged barbed wire through the camp to the cl cleansing station. For those of us who had passed the first selection, this was a real bath. Again, our illusion of reprieve found confirmation. The SS men seemed almost charming. Soon we found out their reason. They were nice to us as long as they saw watches on our wrists and could persuade us in well-meaning tones to hand them over. Would we, not have had, had, would we not have had to hand over all our possessions anyways? And why should not that relatively nice person have the watch? Maybe one day he would do, what, do one good turn for us. 
We waited in a shed, which seemed to be the anteroom to the disinfecting chamber. SS men appeared and spread out blankets onto which we had to throw all our possessions, all our watches and jewelry. There were still naive prisoners among us who asked to the amusement of the more seasoned ones who were there as helpers if they could keep a wedding ring, a medal, or a good luck piece. No one could yet grasp the fact that everything would be taken away. I tried to take one of the old prisoners into my confidence, approaching him furtively. I pointed to the roll of paper in the inner pocket of my coat and said, look, this is the manuscript of a scientific book. I know what you will say, that I should be grateful to escape with my life, that that should be all I can expect of fate, but I cannot help myself. I must keep this manuscript at all costs. It contains my life's work. Do you understand that? Yes, he was beginning to understand. A grin spread slowly over his face. First pious, then more amused, mocking, insulting, until he bellowed one word at me in answer to my question. A word that was ever present in the vocabulary of the camp inmates. Shit! At that moment, I saw the plain truth and did what was marked, what marked a culminating point of the first phase of my psychological reaction. I struck out my whole former life. Suddenly, there was a stir among my fellow travelers who had been standing without pale, frightened faces, with pale, frightened faces, helplessly debating. Again, we heard the hoarse, hoarsely shouted commands. We were driven with blows into the immediate anteroom of the bath. There were assembled around an SS man who waited until we had all arrived, and then he said, I will give you two minutes, and I shall and I shall time you by my watch. In these two minutes, you will get fully undressed and drop everything on the floor where you are standing. You will take nothing with you except your shoes, your belt, or suspenders, and possibly a truss. I am starting to count now. With unthinkable haste, people tore off their clothes. As time grew shorter, they became increasingly nervous and pulled clumsily at their undergarments, belts, and shoelaces. When we heard the first sounds of whipping leather straps beating down on naked bodies, Next, we were herded into another room to be shaved. Not only our heads were shorn, but hair was, no hair was left on our entire bodies. Then onto the showers where we lined up again. We hardly recognized each other, but with great relief, some people noted that real water dripped from the sprays. While we were waiting for the shower, our nakedness was brought to, home to us. We really had nothing now except our, our, our bare bodies, even minus hair. All we possessed literally was our naked existence. What else remained for us as a material link with our former lives? For me, there were my glasses and my belt, the latter I had to exchange later for a piece of bread. There was an extra bit of excitement in store for the owners of trusses. In the evening, the senior prisoner in charge of our hut welcomed us with a speech in which he gave his word of honor that he would hang personally from that beam, he pointed to it, any person who had sewn money or precious stones into his trust. Proudly, he ex explained that as senior inhabitant of the camp, laws entitled him to do so. Where our shoes were concerned, matters were not so simple. Although we we're supposed to keep them, those who had fairly uh, decent pairs had to give them up, after all, and were given in exchange shoes that did not fit. And for real trouble, were those prisoners who had followed the apparently well-meant advice given in the anteroom of senior prisoners and had shortened their jackboots by cutting the tops off then smearing soap on the cut edges to hide the sabotage. The SS men seemed to have waited for just that. All suspected of this crime had to go to the small adjoining room. After a time, we heard again the lashings of the strap and the screams of the tortured men. This time, it lasted for quite a while. Thus, the illusions came Illusions some of us still held were destroyed one by one. And then, quite unexpectedly, most of us were overcome by a grim sense of humor. We knew that we had nothing to lose except our so ridiculous naked lives. When the shower started to run, we all tried very hard to make fun, both about ourselves and about each other. After all, real water did flow from the sprays. Apart from that strange kind of humor, another sensation seized us, curiosity. I have experienced this kind of curiosity before as a fundamental reaction towards certain strange circumstances. When my life was once endangered by a climbing accident, I felt only one sensation at the critical moment, curiosity. Curiosity as to whether I would come out of it alive 
with a fractured skull or some other injury. Cold curiosity predominated even in Auschwitz, somehow detaching the mind from its surroundings, which came to be regarded with a kind of objectivity. At that time, one cultivated the state of mind as a means of protection. We were anxious to know what would happen next and what would be the consequence, for example, of our standing in the open air in the chill of late autumn, stark naked and still wet from the showers. In the next few days, our curiosity evolved into surprise, surprise that we did not catch cold. You listen to those words and it's hard to imagine, you know, what these men and women went through. But at the same time, we recognize, you know what, these bodies are just temporary. And we are waiting, right? Jesus has promised us life and life abundantly. And that life abundantly is, is life abundantly with him in heaven. And that's what we wait for. Even if we have nothing, not even the hair on our bodies, we have everything if we have Jesus. All right. We have one more hymn. Mm -hmm. I, um, in these troubled times, um, I've always found a particular hymn, um, It Is Well With My Soul, to be um, sort of the answer to me. And I hope that uh, you will find it equally meaningful. It was written by a man who, like um, Pastor Todd was saying, somebody who had lost everything. He lost his son, he lost his money in Chicago fire, he lost four daughters in a boat trip overseas. Um, he had nothing, um, but he sat down and put his pen to paper and wrote, It is well with my soul. <laughs>
Taurus holiday? Nope. Nope. <laughs> Have a good day, and uh, we'll be seeing you around in your rooms and visiting a little bit, so looking forward to that. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. We'll see you around.